It's the essence of our worship, right? We adore you. We adore you. We adore you, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Lord, we do adore you, all of us. We praise you. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise him with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Let the godly ones exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Lord, we praise you with our lips for your loving kindness is everlasting. And we worship you with our giving, for your loving kindness is everlasting. And Lord, this morning, we just lift up those who are on their beds. Lord, we pray that they would sing praises. And Lord, how blessed we are to know that indeed your godly ones who are afflicted are singing your praises. Lord, we lift up Jansen Gossage. Lord, we pray that you would touch him physically. We thank you for just your work in his life already. Lord, we thank you for answered prayer that the chemotherapy is going well and he's been able to come home and take chemo there. But Lord, we pray that you would continue to heal him. We pray that you would encourage Caitlin, Lord. We pray that you would use this to draw them closer as we know that you are to you and to each other. And Lord, we pray as um, the siblings are going through the whole matching process for uh, stem cell transplant, Lord, we pray that you would guide in that and encourage the whole family as they participate in your ministry of healing of Jansen. And Lord, we pray for our missionary, Mike Richardson's son, Benjamin, in a critical accident that took the life of his new bride. Lord, we pray that you would help him to recover with just massive internal injuries. There are so many complications related to this. But Lord, we know that you're the great physician and you can heal him. We pray you touch him with healing now. Pray that you would encourage the Richardson family and we pray that you would use this to touch those that they are seeking to reach in Mexico. And uh, Lord, we pray that you be glorified through what you do in and through Benjamin Richardson's life and recovery. Lord, we continue to pray for Joan Schneider for her recovery. Pray that you would strengthen her so she's strong enough to come home, especially for the holidays. And Lord, we pray that you would go before each one of us, as we participate in this reverse advent, as we reach out to our neighbors, Lord, I pray that um, you would work in the hearts of our neighbors, 
that would use us, but Lord, we pray, we trust you completely for the work that you are doing. And Lord, we also uh, lift up Jack as he's got, a, it sounds like an awful cold. Pray that you would help him to get through that, to speak to us, and that you would use him to touch our hearts with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I think Brittany and David are coming up. Good morning, church. Uh, we're tag teaming announcements today. I am Brittany, this is Pastor David, and uh, the announcements are all around Advent and just what we're doing here at Blue Ridge uh, for the Christmas season, and so I'll just run through some of those in a minute, but I just wanted to tie them together, the purpose. A lot of us know, but if you're like me, you get distracted. Hopefully I'm not the only one. Um, I'm reading a book, and it just mentioned about how every human wants something to celebrate. And so I think that's why everyone at Christmas time gets excited, because especially if you don't know Jesus, it's nice to have something to feel good about. But the purpose, we, like Pastor Tom said, we have hope that's confident. We're celebrating because of Jesus coming and knowing he's coming again. That changes everything. That's not just a feel-good feeling. So I just wanted to remind us of that purpose. Um, if you need some tools to help you remember that during this month, you can join us at the Advent Ridge class, which was super fun. It's happening at 9 a.m. before the service the next two weeks. You could pick up one of the uh, amazing reverse Advent calendars that Pastor David is modeling and use it as a tool for outreach. And what I wanted to mention about that is that this isn't a great time of year for everyone. Sometimes people are lonely and suffering. I know some of us are. So this is a tool for outreach just so that hopefully we as a church can be having Jesus' eyes as we are interacting with people throughout our week. And maybe these are some ideas that you can um, use to help bless others in your life. Um, we've got some other signups on the church website or app for the men's Ironworks event or the kids' Whoville party. So check those out. Um, and I just wanted to close with, if you're a newcomer with us, we're really glad you're here, and we would love to chat with you after the service at the Next Step Station at the back of the church. So, a uh, second announcement from Pastor David. All right, so she gets to present that to you all. Um, so, I'm just here, I, I want to announce that our church is sending a team to, a missions team to South Africa this summer. It's going to be July 20th about, no, I'm sorry, July 11th about to July 22nd about. Um, and so we're sending a team, but we don't know who all is on the team. So um, so if you are interested in coming, and, and you know, a ticket doesn't make you part of the team necessarily. We want, a, we want this whole church to be a sending church, and we want prayer support, and, and we want this to be uh, something where we're all taking part in this. Um, and so we're having actually an info meeting on that next week after church. So coming up quick, if you're interested, it'll be a really short 20 minutes max, just kind of where are we going, how safe is it, um, what are we going to be doing, and, and answering any other questions. So a brief meeting, but we just need to know who is interested on, in that trip. Um, and so that's my announcement. So kids, um, with that, kids, you guys are dismissed to go to Ridge class with Miss Regina. She has some amazing fun for y'all down there. And then adults, we have some amazing fun for you all up here. I think Jack is going to come and bring us the word. All right, good morning. Um, I am just getting over a cold, so I apologize if I sound a little uh, grovelly in my talk today. Uh, I kind of joke with people, maybe now I sound more like God and can speak somewhat authoritatively. Now, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a particular topic, and I sent you an email about this this week. We're going to look specifically at the nation of Israel. Now, I'm covering a lot of material, and because I'm doing so, I want to make this as easy as possible for you. If you have the app on your phone, you can go on there, tap on the tab that says Sermons, and when you come onto that tab, at the bottom, you'll see a tab for Sermon Notes, and if you tap that, You'll have the outline of what it is that we're looking at today, and you'll have a place where you can write your own comments and or questions as a result of it. So just a little bit of a help for you as we move ahead. <clears throat> you know, one of the big issues that I've always struggled with as a pastor, 
uh, has to do with when should sermons begin to respond to events in the world. And the reason that I personally struggle with it is because there's so much that goes on in the world. We can have every Sunday be these things where we're just always reacting to the latest thing in the headline. And if we are always reacting to things, we can't be proactive about the things that are really important. For example, when we were looking at Ezra, we never would talk about confession and repentance. As we look ahead, we wouldn't talk about discipleship because we're dealing with the latest hot topic. And um, it's a struggle. I remember in 2020 in particular, there was this big tagline going around on social media. It's like, if your pastor is speaking about this this Sunday, you need to leave that church. I got a problem with that. I got a big problem with that. Because first of all, it's, you know, it's pretty audacious to tell people where they should be going to church when that's not the criteria for what makes for a good church. And then on top of that, I think the other big problem I have is I feel like it's somewhat manipulative to those that are um, spiritual leaders and trying to force their hand to take on the media's big hot topic of the day. So it's, it's always this tension because you know this, this mess is going on over here and people are talking about it. So to what degree are we going to enter into that and to what degree are we going to stand separate from it? Now, having said all that, there are times when there are things that are going on, and we are wise to address them. We are wise to speak about them. And so uh, what we're going to be doing today is looking specifically at Israel because they have definitely been in the news as of late. And uh, we want to get some teaching on them regarding what does God say about them and what is his long-term plan with them. Very important for us to know. Why is this important for us to know? Two reasons. The first one is, you can't pick up your Bible and read very far before you encounter Israel in some way, shape, or form. So God has them, and he's got them engaged in his plan, and uh, they're so tiny. You realize you can fit 19 Israels just in the state of California? I mean, it's not a big place, and yet they're so small, and they have been so significant throughout time because God has purposed to use them. But the second reason I think it's important for us to address this is because of some of the discussions that I've heard amongst Christians. And Christians having arguments on this based on where they stand regarding Israel. And so people have asked, where does our church stand when it comes to Israel? And so we want to kind of explore some of that and why biblically, not politically. We want to do this biblically. Now, here's what I'm not doing today. I'm not saying Israel's latest trial is an indication uh, that we are in the end times. You know, maybe we are, and maybe we aren't. I can't answer that at this point. What I will say is on New Year's Eve, we are going to take that Sunday morning, and we're going to look ahead at what God has to say about the future. And it will involve Israel, and it will involve the world at large. And um, so we'll try to pull everything together. But I think you'll have a better understanding of the future, and Israel in particular, if you just understand the big picture regarding this nation uh, in terms of what we're going to cover today. Now, before I get to that, i got to give you a little sermon within a sermon. And it works out like this. Um, I'll start first by saying we need to understand about our, something about ourselves. There's a term that is used about us as a church. We are called dispensational. Uh, what do I mean when I say we are dispensational? Well, it means that we're looking at the scriptures and we're interpreting what happens based on how God deals with his people in that time and in that era. So there's a period where God is dealing with his people under conscience. There's a time where God is dealing with his people under law. There's a time when God is dealing with his people under grace. So as we read and we understand the scriptures, we want to understand what era we're dealing with. But more than anything else, I want to say dispensationalism isn't so much a theology as much as it is a way of doing theology. It's very important because whenever we look at an issue or a topic or a passage, I'll tell you right now, every single one of you has some means of how you interpret it. There are rules you have in your mind that you're operating with and how you're going to interpret it. And for some of you, this is the rule don't bother me. Let me just read it and just see what comes out and, you know, however I feel about it at the end of the day. Others want to take it and they're going to hyper-spiritualize things and begin to make it say things that it doesn't, in fact, say. So my sermon within a sermon, real quick, is just kind of give you five sort of, I'll call them rules that we use, lines of interpretation whenever we look at a passage. And I'll use the acronym in lowercase l, G-H-T but it looks like night, so it's easy to remember, right? And these words stand for this. We interpret the Bible using normal, literal, literal grammatical, historical, and theological lines. 
What do I mean? Normal. We understand the words a normal usage. You read uh, history like you would a history book or like you would a newspaper. You gather the information from it. You don't read a word and go, you know, I think what this word might be meaning is. No, you just say, well, how does it fit within its context? You also understand it literally. And by that, you understand it in its ordinary sense unless the context requires you to find a figurative interpretation. So again, that doesn't mean every single word in the Bible we're going to interpret literally. You know, you go to the book of Revelation, and uh, uh, it says of Christ that he's got these seven lampstands. And you're like, hmm, well, what are those? Well, the Bible uses them as a figure to then go on and explain they represent the seven churches. So the key behind a lot of the figurative, though, is the Bible often will explain it to you. If you're just patient and you continue to read, you will get the explanation as you go. Then there's also the grammatical. You read the text with normal rules of grammar and interpreting. Or is this past tense, present tense, future tense, perfect tense? What is it? This will help you in understanding what it is you're addressing. And then the historical context. See a passage in its context when the works were written. Now, folks, to be very candid, this is the hardest one for nearly everybody because it takes an awful lot of work to get here. And this is, I think, in some ways, I'll say sadly, but in other ways, I'll say I'll get it. This is why a lot of people will say, well, my pastor says this, or my favorite radio preacher, or my favorite you know, internet preacher says this, because they've done the work of looking into the historical setting to understand what's going on in that time. But you've got to be careful, because if you just read a passage and you bring it into today without thinking about how it applied back then, you're very likely to misinterpret it. Finally, there's theological Consideration of the whole Bible when reading a theological position. So you understand it, but then you may need to read a little bit more. And so a great picture of this, you're reading your Bible through in a year, you come to the book of Leviticus and you find out you can't eat shrimp. Oh, I love shrimp. Why can't I do that? Well, you keep reading, you get all the way down to the book of Acts and you find that the, the ceremonial laws have been fulfilled, the dietary laws are no longer in practice. So you had to see the Bible as a whole to understand the whole theology behind what it is that you read. And this is what drives what we believe about anything, about anything. Interpreting with these lines shows us what the Bible means, and from that, we then begin to deduce a conclusion. It places us in a belief. We don't just go, man, I, I got a gut feeling about this, you know, and then make our interpretation based on that. Because I'll tell you, I'd be the first one. If that's the way we did it, the first doctrine that would go would be hell. I don't like that doctrine. It doesn't feel good in my gut. And I'd like to say, that one goes away, but we can't do it. We have to say, what has God taught? And so we're striving to the best of our ability to understand what it is God wants us to know and what he's revealed. So our understanding about Israel comes because we're using these rules of interpretation and understanding who they are. So remember that, N-L-G-H-T, and we'll come back to it later. So let's move into Israel now. If we're going to understand God's big plan for them, God does something for us. He gives us four big anchor points in the scriptures to explain what he's doing with them. And the points are going to be these specific promises that God has given to his nation. Now, before we get to that, let me just kind of run you through a little bit of a history. Probably be familiar to a lot of you, but what I hope to do is connect the dots as you see the history as we go along. We go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And it's there you find that God created this fellow up here whose name Oh, there we go. There he is, Adam. And Adam has three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. Cain is evil. He kills Abel, so Abel has no descendants. And God says, I'm not going to continue the main line of descendants through these guys. I'm going to do it through this guy, whose name is Seth. And from Seth, we trace a line of descendants, and we go all the way down to this fella, a guy named Noah. You might have heard of him, big flood, floating zoo. That's the guy. <coughs> Noah has a line. He's got three sons. He do, I don't have them on the map over here, but you've got Ham, Japheth, and then you've got this one over here. His name is Shem. Shem's name, and we get the root word Sem for Semitic out of this name. But from Shem, we find another guy, and his name, as we trace down his heritage, is this fellow named Abram. And when we encounter Abram, he's living in what's modern-day Iraq. And while he's there, He's called by God, and God says, I want you to get up, and I want you to go to another land. And that land is currently Israel. And it's there 
that God makes this first covenant with him. And it's in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And we have a, we, theologians or whatever, have labeled this the Abrahamic covenant for obvious reasons. It's a covenant given to Abraham. And there's three parts to it. You see how it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land, the land which I will show you. So that's your first part, the land. What is it? At that time, it was called Canaan. Once Israel goes in and possesses it, it's called Israel. When the, when the uh, Romans take over and uh, occupy the land, they rename it and they call it Palestine. They're trying to align it with something a little bit more in the Greek heritage. So they, they, each, each, each group of people has changed the name. Verse 2, he says, I will make you a great nation. So here we get to the second part of the covenant, that God is going to give Abraham descendants and a volume of descendants such that they will grow into and become a great nation. So the lineage will become a national entity. He goes on, he says, and I will bless you and I'll make your name great and so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So in that great blessing to the world that God wants to do in and through this little nation. Now, I want you to notice something. There's no conditions on this. God didn't say, if you do this, then I'll do it. God just says, I'm doing it. Why would he do that? I don't know. And why would he pick Abraham? Because he did. That's it. We don't, we don't get the, the reason behind why God chose him. And after this choosing and after this covenant and this promise, God then goes and he renames Abram later and gives him a new name of Abraham. Now, i got to interrupt this. The ultimate sign of a descendant to be a blessing actually gets explained to us in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Galatians, where we learn that these descendants actually open the door and establish a pathway for a singular descendant, the only Jew that ever fulfilled all the purposes for which God had intended for the people of Israel. He's the only one to bring the immense blessing. His name? Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. But just because we see those blessings in him does not negate the promise that God gave to these people regarding a nation and their descendants and the land. Well, we continue on. Abraham goes on through his life, and uh, he has some children. And uh, his wife, Sarah, is old, and he thinks, well, we can't have children. We're too old. Sarah takes her handmaid, Hagar, and says, Abram, why don't you have a child with her? He does, and lo and behold, we get Ishmael out of this. But God says, that is not the line that I've chosen. That is a child of the flesh. That's your own doing. I gave a promise. I'm going to see it through, and you're going to have a child through Sarah. And sure enough, they do, and his name is Isaac. And it's to Isaac that God later will appear, and he makes this statement. He reiterates the Abrahamic covenant to him. And it's here, he says the exact same thing, and you can see it here in Genesis 26. Same three components, land, seed, or descendants, and a blessing. Well, then Isaac goes, and he lives his life, and then he has a couple of sons as well. And so we've got them down here. There's Esau, and there's Jacob. And God has chosen to pass over Esau. He's not going to let him be the line, and he moves towards Jacob. And a key incident happens to Jacob one day. He's out, he has a dream, and in the dream, he sees this ladder going up to God. And it's there on the ladder. We, we've termed it Jacob's ladder. But seeing that, God reiterates to him the Abrahamic covenant. What I promised to Abraham, I've also promised to you. I'm going to see it through. And you see it in Genesis 28, and you see the same three conditions, land, descendants, and a blessing. Later on, it's at uh, Peniel when Jacob is wrestling with a man. And he doesn't know it at the time, but later he comes to find out it's God himself. And uh, that individual gives him a new name. His old name, Jacob, means supplanter or deceiver. How would you like that to be your name? You know, kind of like someone calling you a liar. Uh, you, you, don't have, you don't live up to high expectations with a name like that. God changes it. And instead, his name now will be called He Who Strives With God, also known as Israel. That's what it means. He Who Strives With God. Israel goes on, he's got 12 sons, they become the 12 tribes, and later on in a time of famine, the Israelites, the 12 tribes, they make their way down into Egypt to get food, and they wind up staying there for an extended period, actually becoming slaves, to the point they can't get out. And God says, I'll deliver you. 
And he does so by sending plagues upon the Egyptians, 10 plagues in particular, such that the Egyptians sent them away. And they were then told by God, now I want you to go back in the land which we started, into the land of Canaan. Because God said, with the Canaanites, I'm running them out because their wickedness is so great that I'm not going to allow them to remain in the land. Well, I think I passed it. Oh. Sorry, we got these four points. These points here regarding uh, the Abrahamic covenant. Land, seed, and a blessing. All right. Leviticus passage. Uh, God says, I'm going to remove them. Their wickedness is that great. I have to expel them from the land. And now the land is going to become Israel's. And this is going to push us into the second anchor point. Very important part. It's a time of crisis for the nation. Here they are getting ready to go in the land. Moses has been their leader for so long. Moses is now dead. We've got this unproven leader. His name is Joshua, and he takes the lead under God's guidance. And standing at the entrance of this new land, one filled with Canaanites, God says, I got a covenant that I'm going to make with you. And it's in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 10. And we have termed this the Palestinian covenant. Now, when you hear Palestinian, you are not to think people. Just like if I took Rocky Mountains, you're thinking a region. And here, Palestinian means Palestine. When theologians were kind of putting this together and sort of trying to uh, find ways to clearly verbalize it, they did it in a day and age when Israel didn't live in the land. It was still referred to by its Roman name, Palestine. And hence, you have the Palestinian covenant. Now, due to time, I'm not going to go through all ten verses of what this covenant promises, but I am going to give you the summary, seven points that it comes about. Because this covenant that God makes with his people is two things. It's a prophecy as well as a promise. And it's in the prophecy, he says, Israel one day is going to go in the land, but they're going to be unfaithful. And because of that, I'm going to kick them out. But one day in the future, they're going to repent. They're going to turn. And as a result, the Messiah will come and be with them, and they will be restored as God's people. They will be converted as a nation of people. Their enemies are going to be judged as a result of it, and the nation itself will receive the full blessing of God. This has not yet happened. This is an unfulfilled prophecy right now. In fact, later on, the prophet Ezekiel reasserts this sort of in a comparison in chapter 16 when he speaks about Israel and he likens Israel to being like a, a, a child of God that he would love and dote on. And then later he goes to compare uh, Israel to a bride, but a bride who becomes unfaithful and becomes a harlot. And God makes the point, you've been unfaithful, Israel, not me. I'm going to remain faithful unto you. And it's this covenant in Deuteronomy 30 where we see this coming out as a result of the land. In fact, we could say Deuteronomy chapter 30 is Israel's title deed to that land. <clears throat> That's the second anchor point. There's a third one in understanding about Israel uh, and being in the plan of God. And that is during the times of the kings, God made another covenant and did this one with Solomon but in, in uh, doing it, we've labeled it the Davidic Covenant. Now, I, we have looked at this one actually in depth. I don't know if, if you were here in the summer. We did it. Uh, in fact, I called the thing up on the screen here. June 25th of 2023 with the title, I Will Build a House for You. We got an entire sermon devoted just to this covenant and what it means and what it meant. But the main point behind it is simply this, that there is a kingdom rule, a kingdom rule in which David is going to have an unending house or heritage. King David, he will have an eternal throne, he'll have an eternal kingdom, and, um, and a, a, an eternal kingly rule, and that's going to happen from Jerusalem. So, that is Jesus, the King Messiah, and the eternal nature behind it means this is something God does, because if it's left a man, it ain't going to be eternal. God has to make this happen, and he will. And so, while David's line is going to temporarily be restrained, it is not going to be permanently removed. Fourth anchor point. Are you hanging in there with me? All right. And that's the new covenant that God makes with Israel. And you find this in Jeremiah chapter 31. And this also is an eternal covenant because it's not dependent on Israel, on man. It's entirely dependent on God saying, this is what I'm going to do. And he amplifies the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant that he already made. And he goes on to say, now here's what I'm going to do with you, Israel. I'm going to take that hardest stone that you have where you, can't, you may intend to obey, but you can't. I'm going to remove it, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to give you a new power. I'm going to change you from the inside. And the point of these is that these promises, these covenants are unconditional. And as of yet, 
They've been unfulfilled by the nation. All right, deep breath. We got through the main points. All right, now here's what I want to do. I want to talk with you a little bit about why do Christians disagree on this? Because some of you in recent days have probably encountered individuals who had a very different view, that were Christians, very different view on Israel and the role. In fact, some might have even been somewhat hostile. People see Israel just as a, as a land, but it's dirt. It has no significance beyond that whatsoever. What we personally believe about Israel, again, and this is where Christians are going to disagree, um, is what I just described to you. Now, the other view, are you ready for this? Did you have your coffee this morning? I got a six-syllable word for you. Hang on. That word is supersessionism. The other term that we've used is replacement theology. And it's the belief that because Israel has chosen not to follow God and has rejected God, that God has rejected them, and now God has started the church, and the church replaces Israel with the promises and the covenants and the purpose and everything else. And so it's a different look at that. Now, the explanation of how Christians arrived there, I apologize. I ain't got time to go through and explain it. In fact, if anything, I feel like I'm just going to have to oversimplify this and sort of gloss over a lot of things. But I want to highlight this. Christians who hold to a different view, let's just remember something. They're not our enemies. Did y'all hear that? They are not our enemies. Uh, They are not, while we might disagree with them, they're not idiots, they're not ignorant, they're not lazy with their Bibles. What they do is they do a little bit of a different approach for the NLGHT method that I explained to you earlier. And probably the biggest problem that we have with their view that Israel, or the church has replaced Israel, is that we have to dismiss the literal promises that God made to Israel, particularly about the land, and now trying to apply them to the church figuratively. We're changing our Bible method. We're going from literal understanding to what we think, and we're applying it figuratively. And we wind up abrogating the promises that God made to that nation. And in addition, it makes us have to do a little bit of violence to the normal, grammatical, and historical reading of Romans 9, 10, and 11, which is a key passage regarding God's plan with Israel. So, we don't understand ourselves as having taken Israel's place. But rather, we have been grafted into the plan that God has. We've been brought alongside. And the church is not an Old Testament revelation. If you go looking through those Old Testament pages, you're not going to find us. It's not in there. It's a surprise, a new thing that God has started, and it's comprised primarily today, not of Jews, but of non-Jews. And as non-Jews and being grafted in, do we have blessings? Everybody say, yeah. Yeah, we have some pretty amazing blessings. You know, we like the blessing of Jesus in the Abrahamic covenant. The blessing of the gift of a new heart that we received in the new covenant. But our experiences of those blessings do not negate the nation of Israel's covenant promises by God for them one day in the future when Messiah will return. Again, the New Testament book of Romans, Paul gives a pretty expounded lesson of the gospel, addressing the condemnation of all humanity. He starts with the world at large, and then he goes into the people that are moral, but that doesn't make them righteous before God. And then he moves into the Jews specifically. In addressing the Jews, he does make a distinction in speaking about Jews who are Jews physically, but they're not Jews spiritually. They're born physically into the tribe but they haven't followed God like they meant to. And they've rejected him. And they fall under condemnations. And Romans highlights passages that are in both Deuteronomy and Isaiah. Uh, mentioning that other nations, through other nations, what God's going to do is make his people jealous. As they see the blessings that we get, it's ricocheted off of them and hit us. And they're meant to be moved to a jealousy because of that. But currently, as a nation, They are in rejection. So the question is this. Was God done with them? Is 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 they they a lost cause? Not one bit. Again, we go back to Paul, what Paul says in Romans 11, that despite Israel's hardened hearts for now, they are not rejected. Because as the scriptures say, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. When God makes a promise, he's going to see it through. Is everybody going to say amen to that? It's a good thing. Because if God is going to keep his promises with Israel... I'd say there's a pretty good chance he's going to keep his promises that we're banking on as well. So he has to be consistent. But in the meantime, 
regarding the nation of Israel. There's a partial hardening that has come into that nation until what the scripture says, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When is that? I don't know. It's when God looks and he goes, okay, these are the Gentiles I wanted to deal with. And then he turns and he goes, now Israel, we're going to deal with you. I'm going to bring you back to myself. And we see in the New Testament that kind of gets kicked off when the church is raptured up and we are out. And from this point, we find God is going to be taking the world and he's going to break Israel. And I mean break them. We thought things that happened to them in the past were rough. There's nothing compared to what is coming down the pike until they are finally brought to the point where they will look upon he whom they have pierced and they will grieve as for an only child having been lost. And they will recognize their Messiah and he will rescue them from their enemies and convert them and rule from Jerusalem. In other words, what I referred to earlier, that Palestinian covenant. And God will be faithful. Whew. So what do we do with it? What do we do with all this? What do we do with Israel? Do we consider them as a Christian nation? No. They're not a Christian nation. No. But I will say this, as Christians, we stand with them. We stand with them in their right to exist. We stand with them in their right to defend themselves. But what we don't do is just give them a blank check and say, whatever you do, yeah, we're just going to approve it. Actions have to be consistent with truth and righteousness and the person and the character with God. But we want to support her in all the things that we can and assist and help. It was uh, Benjamin Disraeli, who was the Jewish prime minister of Great Britain, who said in the 1870s, this is 100 years before Israel got statehood, that the Lord deals with the nations as the nations deal with the Jews. And I can't help but think that he got this actually from Ezekiel 35, verses 14 and 15, when God said to Edom, who was celebrating when Israel was being put down, as all the earth rejoices, I'm going to make you, Edom, a desolation. And as you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate, so I will do to you. And then they will know that I am the Lord. And has history shown us that pattern? Yes, it has. See also Pharaoh who will kill Israel's little boys. And God says, no, you're not doing that. And in fact, I'll bring all kinds of chaos on you for that. Or Sennacherib, who will try to take over the kingdom and surround it with his mighty army, and God will disband that. Or Hitler, who will kill six million of them. But God says, they're going to outlast even you. And so how do the Jews remain? How do they survive all this? The only explanation, but God. They are preserved by God. So as I said on the last Sunday of uh, this month, New Year's Eve, we're going to look ahead at God's timetable and what all this means for us, for them as a church, as we see and understand what the Bible says about the future. But in light of everything I just gave you, what do we do with this? Can I suggest six takeaways from you and run through them real quickly? Here's the first takeaway. Let's realize first that Israel is distinct from the church. Don't start applying the promises that are given to the nation of Israel to the necessarily to the church and definitely not the United States. Can Mexico apply those principles or apply those promises? No, because they didn't receive them. Can Norway? No, because they didn't receive them. Can the United States? No, because we didn't receive them. Those are national uh, promises to a nation, a singular nation. Israel is a race of people. The church isn't a race of people. It's an amalgamation of races. We're from all over. Israel is a nation. The church is a community of people coming from the nations, from all over the planet. And the church, Israel is a religion. I would go one step further and say we're more than a religion. We are a community of faith bound to the same God that they are meant to worship. And I got to tell you, I get pretty nervous when I hear people talking about, you know, starting up a Christian nation. Don't get me wrong. I would love to see a nation that is moral and united and one under God. But the problem with this whole Christian nationalism sort of thing, before long, you start taking promises that were guaranteed to Israel or were stated and given to Israel, and you start applying them to your own people. We can definitely get principles. Be careful about taking their promises. We, as a nation in particular, are not promised an enduring nation. I would love for it to be, but that is not our promise. Second point, realize Israel is always going to be in the news. Don't be afraid when you see it. Don't panic if things change for them because you just heard God has a plan. He's fixed it. 
That's not going to change. We may not understand how it unfolds in the, in the intricate details, and there may be a systems of twists and turns that happen, but God has his purposes for that nation. So don't be scared when you see them in the news. We can be sympathetic, but don't be scared. Third, we need to be in prayer for Israel. We need to pray what Psalm 122.6 says. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray that the true remnant of Israel will come out of Israel. And that when that nation goes through their trials and their difficulties and their adversities in and through the world, that those things will either fail or that God will accomplish his purposes in and through those hardships. Fourth suggestion. Be careful. Do not hurt your testimony to a lost world while you're discussing Israel's role with those people of a different view. This is the one that also makes me nervous because I've seen it on social media. And that is we can get into these discussions that's good and healthy. We can get into these debates with other Christians. That's good and that's healthy. We should be able to do that. But what we can't do is lose our Christian testimony while we're arguing about this, trying to win and beat other people down, and the lost world is looking on and they're going, what are they even about? They're just all about fighting and, you know, working out their finer points. We can discuss this, but we've got to be civil, and we've got to be biblical, and we've got to be loving. That's the key, even if we don't agree on this matter. Fifth takeaway, there is a battle for truth. Speak truth. You be real careful here. We live in a day in which propaganda is the new weapon of warfare. And there's all kinds of propaganda out there. Misinformation is used to get empathy. It's designed to arouse emotions improperly. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember this in your history books, but there's a video of Adolf Hitler when he received word of a particular um, country falling or collapsing. And he stomps his foot on the ground. And our PR people took that and they cut cut the film and they made a loop out of it. And then they broadcast it to Americans who it looked like he was doing a dance. And the whole idea was to get us all upset as to how much he was celebrating. See how happy he is? And it was designed to arouse our emotions. Well, that happens all the time. And you think propaganda, that, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an antiquated means of propaganda there. Because now we got things like deep fakes and AI, and it's getting tougher to discern the truth. And my caution, don't just instantly retweet the information that you got today, all right? Our reputation hinges on us speaking the truth. That's important for us. Consider your sources. Be wise, be objective, and be careful that you don't fall for propaganda. So you don't immediately have to respond to a tweet. Did y'all know that? You don't have to do that. Uh, Be wise. I remember, what, 2020, that whole silence is violence. I hate that slogan. You know, that that is just a means of intimidation and pressure for somebody else trying to say, I need you to, I want you to speak on this item that I want to speak on. Sometimes silence is prayer. Sometimes silence is stopping to think about something. Sometimes silence is waiting to gather more information. So we got to be wise. My goodness, a whole lot of people got egg on their faces recently when they learned about a hotel, uh, not a hotel, a hospital, in which a rocket landed. And we were all told it was an Israeli rocket. And then we come to find out later it was an errant missile by Hamas. Those things are going to be the types of propaganda that we will face. So you got to be careful before you just jump into the digital fray. Because I'll guarantee you something. If we, are fa- if we fail to be consistent with the truth of the information around us, we are not going to be heard regarding the truth of the gospel. We've got to be consistent. And six, and finally, when we see Israel in light of the context of the entirety of the Bible, we can quickly understand why the world is so hostile to that nation because anything that God chooses to use or to establish is going to find hostility because behind it, there is a spiritual battle. And it isn't just Israel, right? I mean, the devil devil hates anyone made in the image of God. That's why abortion is such a big deal right now. It's a spiritual issue. Destroy the imago dei while it's still in the womb. And we have to be a people who say, no, we're not going to surrender that fight. It's why the culture is so hostile to the creation order and why the whole LGBTQ thing is so big right now. Because Satan says, no, we're going to defy the creation order. And it goes against that order that he's established, and it hurts people. And that's what he's all about. Steal, kill, destroy. And so we can't surrender the truth for lies. And that's why anytime you go out with the gospel and you begin to proclaim the message that brings life to people, you're going to find persecution. 
because now you just put yourself on the front lines. Amen. Hallelujah. It's what we should be doing. But we can't cower in fear. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why the Jews will always be in hostility. They're a nation that has been chosen by God, and his plans have not ended for them. Even if their hearts are hardened to God right now, there is always going to be a hostility against them. And there will always be times when that nation is going to have setbacks and they're going to have difficulties. But we have to remember the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So some of what we see with them, they might go in remission, right? But they will never ultimately be exterminated. God has his hand on them. It was Louis XIV that asked the mathematician Blaise Pascal what evidence he had for God. And his answer was, the Jews, O king, the Jews. A nation so small, so tiny, so insignificant, chosen by God. And because of that, he is going to fulfill his purposes. Their existence is always going to be a testimony to the power of God. How do we end this? We got to do it in song. Tom, would you come on up? If you've been reading your Bible with us, today you started into the old prophets, Isaiah. We did chapters one and two, reading on our own today. And um, one of the things you read when you see the old prophets is you see Israel's longing, Israel's desire for peace, for God to come upon them and to care for them and to be with them and to rule over them. And so there is a particular Christmas carol in which that cry is just made so evident. And if we won't have all the lyrics, but you'll have enough today that you can go home and review them later, maybe even over lunch with your family. And what you'll find is Israel's history and Israel's constant cry. Israel, their cry at Sinai, O oh, come Emmanuel. You'll find their cry later under the prophets. You'll find their cry as they look for wisdom. And then at the end, the last line, O oh, come desire of nations bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid thou our sad division cease and be thyself our King of peace. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Let's stand and sing. Come, O oh, come, Emmanuel. Then ransom captive Israel. Then was all the exile until the sun of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come. Dark shadow I'll just give you a reminder that uh, a person does not approach God based on their view of Israel. We come to God based on the one Jew who has redeemed us, <coughs> taken our sin upon himself and given us his righteousness.
And if you are someone that has never done that, never understood that, needs to know more about that, we want to help you. There's folks right back here at the Next Step Station, and they are more than happy to speak with you. I'm happy to do so with you or just to pray with you up here. But um, we just want to let you know that. And so this week, as you go out, um, like I said, there's not, not a whole lot you can do for the sake of Israel beyond pray for them. But at the end of the day, we want to be united, we want to be loving, and we want to seek to minister uh, to those Jews, whoever God puts in our path, and not just the Jews, anybody God puts in our path. Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you are sovereign and you have your ultimate plans and you will see your plans through. Thank you that you are faithful. And in the days and the times where we, we go through our lives and we don't necessarily get to connect all the dots, we will trust you and help us to help one another in maintaining that faith. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. That concludes the service, and yet nobody here is dismissed. Every single one of you is sent.